Um, I'm very excited to have Professor Cruz here today. I understand that this is her first talk for any institution related to the University of California system. So in a way, it's her inaugural, it's her inaugural UC talk, and we're very proud to sponsor her alongside, of course, the UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And I note that you're the, the chair of UCLA Southeast Asian Studies here, um, Professor Stephen Acovado. Thank you for attending. Uh, so I'll jump straight into it and I'll introduce our speaker who will be talking about elections in the Philippines, which are heating up. Um, Ceci Cruz joined the faculty at UCLA this fall, just this fall, as assistant professor of political science. Prior to that, she was uh, assistant professor jointly appointed uh, in the Vancouver School of Economics in the Department of Political Science at the University of Brit British Columbia. Her research focuses on social networks and electoral po politics and on issues concerning economic growth and development with a particular interest in the Philippines and Cambodia. Her talk today is drawn from a recent study she conducted in the Philippines with colleagues at Oxford, uh, UBC, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, she received her PhD from UC San Diego. So, well, Professor Cruz, um, the floor is yours. Welcome to the UC system. Thank you so much, Professor Claudio, for that warm welcome to the UC system and also for this, uh, for the privilege of being able to present my work to an audience that no, not only knows the region, but many of you know the country um, very well uh, as well. Um, I'm presenting today joint work with my lovely colleagues, Phil Kiefer, Julian Lebon, and Francesco Trevi, who is not too far from um, you all, I believe. He's, at the, he's here at UC Berkeley um, with the business school. Um, and just to give a little bit of broader context for this project, this research agenda is really motivated by a central problem that's at the intersection of political economy and development. And that's the fact that in many parts of the world, um, especially places like the Philippines, campaigning on policies or good public goods provision is simply isn't a good strategy for winning elections. Um, as one mayor in a municipality in the Philippines once told me, he said, look, Ceci, if I can win elections by building schools and fixing roads, don't you think that I would do it? And you know what, you can't argue with that. He's got a good point there. And so what this paper does and this broader research agenda does is it focuses on the features of the political environment in both developed and developing countries that can make it difficult for politicians to not only campaign on policy promises, but also make it difficult for them to follow through on them. Right. And in particular, the focus that we're looking at here is information, right? If voters don't have enough information to even know what their politicians are promising, they don't have enough information to be able to hold their politicians accountable, then, you know, it's going to be very difficult for them to be able to use policies and promises as the basis of their decision. Right? And so what I'm going to do here today is present work that builds on this great literature, actually, a lot of it done by people on this campus. Um, that have looked at um, the importance of information and providing information to voters. And essentially what I'm going to present are results from an experiment, a field experiment, in which we're trying to use information campaigns to level this accountability playing field between voters and politicians. Right? And then for me personally, I have, um, you know, I think well, I also have, uh, I was telling um, uh, Professor Claudio before the talk is that I, I also have the, the additional aim of going beyond these sort of stereotypes that we might have about unsophisticated voters or uninformed voters to understand how it is that voters respond to campaign information and how they can integrate policy information with their own assessments of candidate performance. Right? And then, of course, our more ambitious aim with all of this work is all of this we're doing with a view towards designing interventions that can change the fundamental way that voters are evaluating politicians in countries like the Philippines, where most of the traditional way of campaigning has been with things like vote buying and patronage and other things. And so what we do is we use a set of information campaigns in consecutive real world mayoral elections in the Philippines that essentially what we're trying to do is we're, we're looking at varying the ability of voters to evaluate candidates on both policy and valence or characteristics types of dimensions. 
Um, we start with a model to inform the research design. It's literally what we we're just trying to do with this is think about, you know, what is what are all the things that voters consider when they vote? And then how can we use information to help them make decisions better? Right. And what this allows us to do is it lets us think about the salience of things like policy separately from the policy preferences that voters might have. And that's something that's kind of difficult to do, right? Like on one hand, you can care a lot about policies in general, but on the other hand, maybe you super duper care about the policies that are gonna help you and your family. The other thing that our model lets us do is it lets us adjust for things that often aren't present in places, places like the US or Canada, and that's things like vote buying. You know, we wanted to understand how much weight do voters place on vote buying and how does information affect uh, you know, the weight that they place on vote buying. And then the last bit that I, I really like a lot is a very simple back of the envelope cost benefit calculation where we're looking at, you know, if we if we can make information work in the sense that information can be a, um, an important factor in the way that people are voting, um, why aren't politicians providing this information on their own, right? So then we show with a cost benefit analysis that you know, the reason why we don't see this organically coming up on its own, absent you know, a group like us or an NGO or media like Rappler providing this information is that even though information can be effective tools for politicians, vote buying tends to be more cost effective. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too at the end. So before I get into did any further, you do need to know a little bit about Philippine politics. And I know here I have the great privilege of speaking to a group in which um, you know that many of you are already familiar with the context. Um, but there's some features of, polit of Philippine politics that I think make it important to understand the results of the experiment. And so the first thing is that parties tend to be very weak. Um, and they tend to be known for personalities rather than policy positions. And so here I have a picture of, this was the standard campaign poster used by all the candidates in the KBL in, in, Locos, in Locos Norte um, at the time that we were doing the first experiment. And what you, get, what you have here is that you see um, Imelda Marcos front and center. Um, and then the, you know, the, I don't even know if you can read in the tiny corner, the name of the political party in the tiny corner, right? So it's like the personality and the family up front. And then, you know, the little in the tiny corner, the party, right? Um, almost unreadable in many cases, right? So um, the other thing that you need to know about this area, this uh, campaigns to the Philippines is that campaigns typically don't have any policy content, right? Now, again, like you'll see more in national races perhaps, but even then sometimes not even, right? So you're much more likely, for example, to see candidates singing and dancing than talking about their policy positions at rallies, right? And so here I have a picture of, um, this is uh, Senator Bong Gravilia when he was campaigning. He's an actor and he's engaging in the typical rally activity. And what you'll see there is that he's handing an envelope um, of, of money and he's taking selfies with the voters, right? So it's like taking selfies, giving out money. Those are super duper common activities for, camp for uh, Filipino politicians when they're campaigning. Now, the flip side of that is that, you know, even though vote buying is technically illegal, it's very pervasive and the rules prohibiting it are rarely in, in, enforced. And so, as you can see, it's often done quite openly, right? Where candidates will have envelopes, they'll just pass them out. Um, my favorite is, you know, a lot of times our campaign, um, our candidates in our in, in Ilocosur would have sandwiches. And then if you flip the sandwich over, there's money underneath, right? Um, so sort of handing out snacks, but then there's money that comes along with it. Um, and so this is a very similar system too, to those of you who are familiar with Latin America, where vote buying is done through brokers with a lot of local knowledge that lets them sort of help identify voters that would be good targets for vote buying and make sure that the groups of voters are keeping their end of the bargain, right? So speaking of vote buying being done very openly, here I have a picture of the enterprising Dadai who's advertising her family's vote for sale, right? So the two, you know, 2,500 pesos for congressmen, for example, is about maybe four to five times the minimum daily wage, right? Um, and so if you think about it, savvy voters like Dadai can make a ton of money on election day, right? They make a lot of money by selling their vote. Now. I'm not, I, part of this picture I wanna show you is to show that yes, it's done very openly, even on the vote selling side of things. But the reason I'm showing you this picture in particular 
is because it also runs counter to the idea that voters are somehow unsophisticated or uninformed or not smart enough. Because look at these numbers for Concejal. So you'll notice here that Dada has two different numbers for Concejal. She has single, this is if you put, she puts just your name, it's 1,000 pesos. Or if, you, if you're happy to be one of three names that she puts down, that's 800 pesos. And that's because Concejal is done by approval voting, which means that Dada is smart enough to realize that it's worth more to put just one name rather than putting you know, the candidate as one out of three. And so she charges more if you wanna be the only name that she puts down, right? And so this idea that you know, these, these voters are savvy enough not just to come up with a menu of prices, but this idea that they're thinking strategically about what these electoral rules no, I uh, mean, to me, runs counter to this notion that, you know, we need to just be educating voters because they're not smart enough, right? And so what we're trying to do here is give them the information that they need to make their own decision, the one that's best for them. And that's really what makes our um, intervention different from a lot of others where, you know, they're just trying to say, don't vote for this person or vote for this person or don't accept money for your vote. Here, what we're trying to do is help voters become more informed, but only on the things that they care about and help them think about, you know, their own preferences in the context of their vote choice. So I'll take a second in case there are any clarifying questions um, for this part. Um, like I said, you know, I love uh, one thing with interdisciplinary audiences, I'm more than happy to take additional questions in the middle, um, or if there's anything you're dying to know about before I get going. Um, and the nice thing is because we have Leloy here, like, uh, you know, to get to have some, like to speak to the broader context. Uh, and you'll see why uh, I was thrilled to have him here in a second when you find out where exactly we did this experiment. Um, so one advantage of working in the Philippines is that essentially the decentralized context lets us run all of these little experiments in a lot of different local elections, right? And these are elections that actually matter, which is nice. The mayors are, um, it, you know, mayors are, are politicians that have a budget that they can uh, allocate on their own. Um, and because they have access to this resource, but with very limit, limited oversight, if they're making policy promises, they can actually deliver on it if they want, right? They do have money and funds that they can put towards those things. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we were thinking about this whole process, you know, like we were thinking, well, what's happening here? What do we think voters care about? And so essentially, we're starting with a very simple state of the world where there's a mayoral race with two candidates. And then we imagine that voters care about two general sets of things, right? Voters care about what kind of schools and health care they have and, you know, what kind of public goods they have. Um, and in our sense, we're thinking about it as how a budget might be allocated. Right. And the other things voters might care about are things that, you know, we call valence, um, but only as a shortcut because valence means like all the other things that we don't, you know, we don't necessarily know how to measure as economists or political scientists. And that's things like can candidate characteristics. So we imagine that voters care if their candidate is honest or seems to be capable. Um, my RAs call this pogi points, right? Like it's like, you know, do you like your candidate? Um, for sort of non-policy reasons or other types of resources, reasons. And then we think, uh, you know, voters are making this decision, but there's an additional um, uh, feature of Philippine politics and that before the election, candidates can offer money to voters, right? And so this is the vote buying that happens. Now, after the election, we assume that mayors, if they wanted to, could implement their preferred policies, right? And so this is just sort of a very simple, simplistic way of thinking about what it is that, um, that we think is happening in this setting. And then this is another, sorry, this is, uh, you know, for all, if there are any economists in here to, that'll help, it's an easier way for them to think about it. But essentially all we're trying to do is like make a list of everything we think that voters care about, right? And so we think voters care about vote buying. Um, we think voters care about whether the candidate has nice characteristics that they like. And then we also think that on some level, we probably could make voters care about policy, right? And here's where the reason why there's all this, uh, you know, there's this equation here and different features of it is because to us, policy seemed to be a little more complicated, right? Like it, we thought maybe, you know, people could care about policy in general, but then maybe they have specific features of policy that they might care especially about, 
right? So it's not just about, you know, are you going to have a lot of, you know, if you're, if, um, you know, if uh, my colleagues are running for department chair, what policies are they going to put forth for the department? But maybe I care a lot about, you know, support for assistant professors, right? Because I'm an assistant professor. And so that would be um, a policy preference that I have separate from whether I care about policies at all, right? And so this is just a fancy, you know, like it's like long form way of, for us to essentially be outline and think about all the different dim dimensions of vote choice. Um, in fact, my colleagues in American politics, they tease me a lot. They say, oh, you have that equation, but for us, we don't need, you know, you can take out everything that you have on there. All we need to know is whether you're Republican and Democrat, and then we know how you vote, right? So, um, uh, which I think is a point well taken. Um, indeed, you know, they could probably predict voter behavior just as well as we can, but we have to do it in a place where parties are really weak. And so we can't use those kind of shortcuts. So that's why we have that, all those other different dimensions of vote choice. And now here I mentioned, you know, why it is that I'm thrilled to have um, uh, Professor Claudio as I'm my moderator for the broader historical um, context of this region, but um, we conducted this field experiment in 2013 and 2016, together with the PPCRV, which is the Catholic Church's voter education arm. And we did this in two provinces in the North, Ilocos Norte and Ilocos Sur. So these are traditionally, these two places are, um, you know, we, we essentially, we were trying to pick places that would be even, you know, a difficult sell for policy. Um, and it, with the rationale that if we can make policies matter here, then probably we can make policies matter in less difficult uh, political areas in the Philippines. And the reason why I would characterize them as being difficult, and again, I said, like, you know, we can, Professor Claudio will be able to give us much better context here. But Ilocos Norte is the traditional stronghold of the Marcos family, and Ilocos Sur also has you know, these sort of family dynasties and uh, a tradition of the ten a tendency towards very coercive pol politics as well. And so what we did in these two areas is we collected data from every mayoral candidate in contested municipalities. And we basically asked them how they would allocate you know, public goods and across 10 different sectors, right? And so what we, were, we, what we did was we had these poker chips and a worksheet of you know, things like health and, and water and sanitation and education. And we just asked mayors to sort of put the poker chips down to represent how they would prioritize their spending if they win uh, the elections. Um, and what we found is that, you know, the mayors were taking this task very seriously. They're like putting their chips down. Um, I remember one mayor even told me, he said, oh, Ceci, I never thought about it this way before, that if I'm spending more on health, that means I have to spend less on education or something else. And I remember thinking, I'm like, you know, this is, you're a two-term mayor, and this is the, you know, the first time you thought about these kind of budget trade-offs. Um, so that's when I thought maybe this was also a little bit of a politician education campaign in addition to a voter one. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so essentially we take all of these responses that the candidates had and we use it to prepare two sets of flyers that we were distributing to the voters. Right. And I'll show you what those flyers look like. Um, I do wish we were in person because usually what I do is I just bring them and I can pass them out and you can see them. Um, but what we have is in the front, we have um, just some information about the municipal development fund. Essentially, we're telling them that, you know, your mayor gets this allocation of funds that they can spend for your, um, uh, for your municipality. Um, and then the back uh, material is just uh, a little bit about our NGO partner as well. I actually think in this audience, I probably have people who can uh, speak Ilocano and can translate it. Uh, or can read the flyers and everything else. So um, that might be a first for me to give this presentation to a group where I'm pretty certain there's people who speak Ilocano out in this audience. Um, and so the inside of the flyer, you'll see that um, why we had to do this initiative in person, right? So it's a little complicated and we want to make sure that voters were understanding what it is that we're doing. So for example, we didn't want them to think that we were just rating the candidates, right? We wanted them to know that this information came directly from the candidates and that we were just presenting it to them, right? Um, and so here, what you'll see is um, uh, we have the information that we collected from the two candidates. 
Um, and we, we just showed it visually using these 10 different sectors or areas where candidates can put their municipal budget. And then that way voters can sort of look and see, oh, you know, so uh, Riolita Balbalan is proposing to spend 25% of her budget on roads while Cornelio Carta is pre preparing to spend less on roads, but he's spending, you know, 30% on agricultural assistance. Right. And so just this idea that um, to help them make sure that they understood the flyer. Um, and then at the bottom here are just the, the candidates can um, provide three promises that they're that they would like voters to know. Um, and so that just gets replicated there at the bottom. Right. Now, the, we the difference is because we had we were able to do this in two consecutive elections. We repeated the same exact um, uh, experience of, you know, uh, at talking to the to the to the candidates and producing flyers. We repeated that in 2016, but with a key difference, and that's because we already had the flyers from 2013. Essentially, we had two sets of flyers, right? So the first flyer, the one from 2016, can tell them about the promises of their current candidates. But the, if, if we gave them both the 2016 flyer and the 2013 flyer, what that means is that they know both the promises of their current candidates, but also they knew what their, in, their incumbent candidate, their current mayor, they knew what their current mayor promised last time, right? And so essentially what this means is that if you had both flyers, you know not only what your mayor is promising now, but also whether or not they kept their promises from the last time around. Right, and so what we do is we use that um, 2013 flyer as an extra treatment arm, and I'll, I'll talk, talk to you a little bit about what we mean by that um, when we're talking about this um, this information campaign. And so essentially, what we do we did is we started with these 158 villages, um, and then what we're doing is we're just randomly, you know, like we we match them all um, in in triplets used by. Um, uh, it, you know, like taking villages that were similar within municipalities. And then each time we had a set of three, we would basically, you can imagine flipping coins. So one of them gets assigned to get no flyers at all. One of them gets assigned to get just the 2016 flyer. And the other gets um, the 2016 or and the 2013 flyer, right? Now, why are we doing it this way? There, you know, we can imagine another research design to think about the effect of information. We could just measure people before and after, for example. But we did it this way because, you know, that way anything that was happening in the context of the campaign would happen to all of them equally. And so at the end, all we need to do is compare, right, how the differences between the groups that got nothing and the groups that got different types of flyers to see whether um, the information was affecting the way that they were deciding to vote. Right. And so this is a very similar kind of setup to, um, for example, uh, the clinical trials for the vaccine, right, where they give somebody a sugar pill and then somebody else a different type of medicine, right, or, uh, or medical type of trials, um, where essentially they're, they're taking two groups that are and then just randomly picking some to get the, the vaccine and some to get a placebo, and then that way they can test the effectiveness of it, right. And so what do we think is happening here to our different groups? Well, the, um, the first group is getting no information, right? There's no flyers that go to them. Um, that first treatment group gets um, the ability to compare their current candidates in 2016, right? So you essentially get just the information about your current candidates. Now, what we think is happening with this third group then is that not only can they compare their current candidates, but they can also evaluate whether their sitting mayor, their incumbent mayor, kept their previous promises, right? And so that's really key to this. And note that, you know, we don't tell them to do this. This is, uh, again, you know, on the basis of we believe voters to be much more sophisticated than we give them credit for. So we just told them, oh, and by the way, here's the 2013 flyer. We don't tell them what to do with it. It's up to them if they want to use that information in that way or not, right? Any questions about the setup or the research design, just in case? Thank you. 
So I'll move on to the data. The, essentially what we do is for the flyers, we actually gave them out to every household in the villages that were selected in this way. Um, but when we came back to do the survey, we just selected 22 households per village for the survey just to make it a little bit easier to do. Um, and we combined this with electoral results for all the candidates um, in order to, to come up with our findings. And so what are we doing for the interventions impacts? Like, how do we know if this worked? Well, essentially it's a very simple test in that we're just looking at whether the fact that we provided flyers to these randomly selected villages, whether it affected voter support for the incumbent in the 2016 elections, right? And so we essentially wanted to look at the difference between voters in the control group, voters in the treatment group that got just the 2016 flyers, and then voters in the group that got both sets of flyers, right? Um, and I've got the regression equation in there too, just for those of you that find it easier to, to read the, the equation instead of um, the description. But essentially what we're looking at is the, what, how the, the, sim the similarity of the policy positions of the candidate and the voter, how those two things matched up. And how we measure the policy preferences of voters is simple. We just made them do the same poker chip uh, exercise that we had the candidates do. And we're looking at a very simple uh, difference um, uh, or distance between the, uh, the preferences of the voter and the preferences of the candidate. So that's how we can tell whether voters were similar or not. And just a preview of what we find, we find that as a result of this intervention, treated voters are much more knowledgeable and less uncertain about candidate promises. So they actually learned, right? They read the information and remembered it. But importantly, they're more likely to vote for the candidate whose current proposed policies are closer to their own preferences. So that to us was huge um, because that's something that was abs you know, completely absent in um, uh, previous studies of uh, Philippine voters. Additionally, we find that voters in that second treatment arm, remember I told you that some voters got both flyers, they're more likely to vote for their current mayor when she fulfilled her promises. And what we think is happening on here is that they are ass assessing the fulfillment of promises as you know, this candidate being more honest or more capable. And so they're essentially rewarding um, uh, candidates for that. Um, and then results from our model, um, where we put all this data into this the bigger model that I was describing, suggested that the extra emphasis that voters play on place on policy comes at the expense of vote buying. So essentially, they place more weight on policy and they decrease the weight on vote buying in their own voting decision. Right. So that's the um, sort of extra structural piece that we have. Um, and so I'll show you just visually our, our results. Um, I've got three different lines here because actually for us, you know, policies are such a unusual thing in the Philippine political context that we weren't sure how they might matter, right? Do people care about just the top three things they care about? Do they care about all 10 things? You know, do they care about bigger differences versus smaller differences? And so we measured it a couple of different ways. Um, but all of those ways of measuring are consistent. And what we find is that in, um, you know, in the treatment area, it doesn't look like there's much difference in uh, the way that voters are behaving, like they behave like all the other voters. But if you look at the, you know, having received a flyer and being similar to the candidate, that's when you see an increase in people voting for it, right? And so this, this um, uh, baseline of zero, that just shows that there's no difference between, um, between the treatment group and the control group of voter that got no flyers. But what we'll see here is that can, uh, voters in the treatment group are much more likely to vote for candidates when they are similar to them, right? And that's an effect that we see only in those groups that receive the flyers. Um, so I, and essentially what that means in terms of the, uh, uh, the number is that, you know, just one standard deviation of increase in the measure of similarity increases the likelihood of voting for the incumbent by three to four percentage points. Now, if you, you know that there are some elections out there where three to four percentage points would matter a lot, right? And so to us, this is a very big effect um, for political scientists, right? That uh, to have a increase in likelihood of voting by that many percentage points would, would be a sizable effect. 
The other thing we found uh, is that the voters reward incumbents who kept their previous promises. Now, this is something we can only see in that second treatment group, remember the T2, because they're the only ones who had both flyers. And what you can see is the, those two, in, in places where the incumbents had kept promises, um, and by keeping promises, what we mean is that they had produced programs and projects, you know, between 2013 and 2016 that matched up with the flyers, you know, the promises that they had told us in the flyers. And what we find is that voters are also much more likely to vote for people, for candidates who they perceive to have kept their promises. Right. And then again, here's the equival, um, equivalently, um, uh, the equivalent uh table for, for, that, uh, uh, for that graphic as well. So we do a number of mechanism tests and robustness checks to make sure that, um, that we weren't, you know, that we were missing something uh, really big, or even just to make sure that our story made sense, right? Like, is what, we're, what we think happening, is that actually what's happening? So the first is that we find that effects are much weaker it's, it's, for Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. I know you wanted to be interrupted, and I think this yeah, is yes, a, I do, I do, I do. To, Been very quiet because it's methodological. There's a question uh, saying that the similarity variable is not randomly assigned, and it may be correlated with many variables. Do you try to eliminate other possible interpretations based on some variables strongly correlated with the similarity variable? That is from Yosaku Hor Horiuchi. Yeah, so great question. And actually, that um, that was the one that kept us up at night, you know, the thinking about um, uh, actually a little, maybe a little broader than that or, or, or simpler than that in the sense that what we worried about is um, uh, almost the opposite type of effect, right, where people will um, say that they like the policies because they like the candidate, if that makes sense, right? So we did absolutely worry about that. Um, one disadvantage we had is that we didn't have um, the budget to do a baseline survey. So what we have is just the policy preferences of the voters after, which is super difficult. I think um, with a time machine, I definitely would go back in time and do a baseline survey instead, <laughs> a lot simpler. Um, but what's nice is that we're able, so what we try to do instead is essentially we try to rule out the idea that the treated voters are somehow shifting their preferences to match the ones that they prefer. Um, so we do we do this a couple of different ways. Um, one of my favorite ways that we do it is essentially we try to think about the determinants of um, policy preferences. So we're essentially running regressions in the opposite way, right? We're looking at how it determines their policy preferences. Um, and we saw that the determinants of policy preferences were identical in both treatment and control, which means that um, in other words, what that means is that our flyer intervention was not necessarily causing voters to change their preferences. Um, and so what things that determine preferences are things like, you know, if you're a farmer, you want more spending on agriculture. If you're a mom with a bunch of kids under six, you want a lot of uh, health care, maybe. And, um, and then if, you're, if your children may be a little older, you put more weight on education. So this idea that there are these um, empirical patterns in how uh, voters' uh, preferences were happening, but um, that these are identical in both treatment and control, right? So that was one thing, one thing that we looked at. But yes, I think you know we have a, a number of robustness checks just for that particular issue um, because we wanted to rule out the fact that our treatment might have uh, affected the way that those um, preferences were formed or expressed or, or some other um, consideration. Um, and then the other thing that the other types of robustness checks that we looked at um, were we wanted to see whether uh, that, that would the effect be weaker among groups that we would expect not to be responsive to information. And here we were thinking of a very simple one. We thought, well, you know, if you are the brother-in-law of the mayor, then probably you're not going to care what type of policies the mayor has, right? You're just going to vote for the mayor regardless of what the policy is or your similarity in terms of preferences. And we do find that the effects are indeed weaker for those with uh, clientelistic ties to one of the candidates, right? They just, they're less responsive to information. Um, and so that I thought we uh, made sense. We also tested to see whether voters that are reminded of the past promises, if we did find the incumbents that 
um, were fulfilling them? How did, did they also evaluate those incumbents in ways that were consistent with the results that we're seeing on voting? And we do find that in the survey, they also identified those incumbents as being more honest or being more capable, right? Um, and so that sort of goes along the same lines. Um, but yes, absolutely, it's a great question um, and uh, actually a key thing for us in terms of the empirics and the results that we, um, we were interested in. So the other thing that we were looking at is like, wait a minute, and, and I'm sure you, many of you are thinking this already, it's like, wait a minute, if information works to change people's, um, the way that people vote, evaluate candidates, then why aren't candidates doing this themselves, right? So on one hand, yes, policy appeals are very effective, right? We can see changes in the uh, support for candidates, but at the same time, we also notice that policy appeals are completely absent in campaigns, right? So part of this is a little bit that policy is not is, is can be a little bit more of a blood instrument in the sense that it only works if you if the voters like the policies that you're suggesting, right? It's not just it's not like vote buying where you can just give it and then that will you can imagine that it will increase your support. So then we're thinking, well, what if we do a really stringent um, kind of assumption here and think that assuming that candidates can micro target their policy information exactly to the voters whose policy interests are aligned? then would it make it worthwhile to shift to information provision, right? So essentially what we're assuming here is that, uh, you know, they know that uh, they know that I'm a mom and so I'm going to like uh, health healthcare and education. And so they target their campaign to me about healthcare and education. They might know that Professor Claudio maybe has a farm and so they're going to target, you know, agricultural spending to him. Um, and so the idea that, uh, uh, you know, this is already, this is already difficult to do, but we, we have figured, hey, if they know how to target vote buying, maybe they can do this too. Um, and so we did just a very simple back of the envelope cost benefit analysis um, to see why it was that they're buying votes anyway. And what we find is that vote buying turns out to be actually a very cost effective strategy for getting more votes, right? And actually in the Q&A, if you wanna know some interesting things about the political context, you can ask, ask me how we verified all of these different figures, uh, you know, the, the per household price of vote buying or the cost of things like the flyers and the different um, types of things. Um, so I'm more than happy to talk about that more in the Q&A as well. But essentially what we find is that, well, I guess it's two things, right? One is that it explains why information provision hasn't arisen sort of organically, right? Um, but it also, to me, it's a point of optimism in the sense that I don't think that difference is that large, right? You could imagine uh, NGOs stepping in to provide this, right, uh, information, uh, Rappler and yeah, the media, the Philippines very active media, um, Nobel Prize winning media and, and journalist tradition. So you can imagine other groups being able to do this type of information provision um, uh, in this way, even if it's just a jumpstart um, candidates to get them to do it on their own, right? So that's sort of our explanation or our back of the envelope as to why we think it's happening that way. Um, so just to sum up, you know, even in these, uh, even in the Philippines, which is a very, you know, it tends to be characterized as a low information and very clientelistic political environment, right, where certainly there's things like vote buying and family dynasties and all, you know, ways that can make it difficult for voters to evaluate candidates. We find that voters still respond to information in very sophisticated ways, like beyond um, what we might have expected. Um, at the same time, you know, the flip side of that is that we also see why vote buying can be a very attractive can, uh, um, uh, strategy for politicians because it is very cost effective in that sense. Um, but we also hope that the broader implications of our work can be a starting point for how we can close that gap, you know, the sort of cost effectiveness gap between, um, between vote buying and information provision. And again, here, I think the role of the media, NGOs, uh, even the government, you know, Kamalek can also do this as well, um, as a way to think about education and voter information as the basis for interventions to change the way that voters are evaluating politicians in countries like the Philippines um, and, other, and other places. 
Um, I'm especially excited and would love to chat more, especially those of you who are interested or working in the topic. We've got some new projects as well for the upcoming 2022 Philippine elections that includes exactly these types of partnerships with the media and with Comelec, the Elections Commission. Essentially, we're thinking about how to take these results and um, scale them up right, nationwide um, so that we're providing voters with information in these types of ways that are useful to them. And hopefully, um, as a starting point to making policies matter um, at the national level as well. So that is it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, are there any questions? Because, uh, okay, while we wait for questions, I, I have, maybe I'll start while we're waiting for questions. I have, I have a question just about the definition of vote buying. Um, how did you define vote buying in the study? Because I think when I was doing field work it, in 2016 for this election also, I was in Tacloban, I noticed that there was, there, 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 there were various behaviors that could or could not be defined as vote buying. So, for example, in Tacloban, there was this, there was this um, kind of vote buying quotes that was called badil, and that was essentially somebody inserting a 20 peso bill in a, in a flyer about a candidate. So there was really no agreement, but the 20 peso was 20 peso. It was so cheap, right? So 20 pesos, nothing. Um, it was just a kind of small inducement or something to make the medicine go down a bit a bit better. Is, is that vote buying? Um, that's a that's a great question. I actually I think vote buying is really uh, the the form that it takes. I I mean I every time I meet somebody who studies a different country where there's vote buying, I always ask them about what forms it takes. And I think in the Philippines we have the most different forms of vote buying. Like we have vote buying that's just like uh, pamasahe or like a, you know, transportation costs to go to the polls, right? Is that vote buying if a candidate gives you, you know, a uh, bus fare to go to, to go vote? Um, there's snacks, there's fiestas, there's, uh, I think, a whole different range. Um, for here, we limited it to, um, uh, to money uh, for the, because in Ilocos Norte and Sur, there were very specific practices. And actually, we had to ask it differently in Norte because they were doing it in rounds. Like essentially in Ilocos Norte, it's almost like an installment system. You know, they give you a little bit and then they, you know, a month later they give you more. And then right before the election, they give you some more. Um, so I, I wasn't sure what the, there was something interesting going on in that style of vote buying, um, but we wanted to limit it to that. And then we asked about the other things separately. So the things that would be more like um, you know, giving broader assistance or offering a job or reminding you that, oh, you know, I hired your cousin. That's not, we wouldn't count that as vote buying, but we would measure that in the survey as clientelism or the broader links that people might have to the candidate. So they would be somebody with a clientelistic tie to the candidate. Um, but yes, absolutely. It was very hard. Um, we tried to limit it to the forms of vote buying in which there would be some uh, sort of social norm that you would feel obligated to then vote for the candidate. Um, so we would, for example, exclude, you know, the the, 10, the 20 pesos in the flyer would be, that would be just sort of, you know, handing out the flyer rather than uh, vote buying per se. Um, and so our, I think our stats for vote buying, you know, we'd, we'd see about a third of the households reporting, you know, vote buying in the sense where there's some obligation or there's enough money that incurs an obligation um, to vote, but yes, absolutely. I think that's a uh, it's a difficult one of the things that makes it hard in the Philippines is because it takes so many different forms um, that it, it can be hard to measure. Oh, oh okay, thank you. Uh, I I know like there's there's no way to to resolve this issue actually, and then of course there's there's the other issue of nowadays um, there's this discourse of various politicians just telling voters just take the money. And vote your conscience. That's a that's a common refrain nowadays, and it's something that Bong Bong that that the that, that Bong Bong Marcos says. That's something that Vice President Lenny Robredo says. So, so people from different camps are saying the same thing about vote buying. So thank you. Um, Nguyet Tong has a question. Thank you, Nguyet. Oh, two questions rather. She 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 asks: Do candidates think of doing both targeted policy campaigns and vote buying if they have enough funds? And two. How do those you survey react? Are they curious about the experiment and how it works? Uh -huh. That's, those are great questions. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, can I take them in reverse? Because there actually was a group that was super curious about our experiments and that was the mayors and the candidates, right? So they were, they were super interested in what we were doing. Um, I think we actually um, uh, maybe a little too interested in what we were doing in the sense that in 2013 and a lot of times we would, we, as we were leaving after handing out the flyers, like you could see the mayor's um, brokers and the mayor's people coming and then they would come and do extra vote buying or to see what people thought and to sort of uh, assess what was happening as a result of what we were doing. So they definitely had it in their mind that they were responding to what it was we were doing. Um, and then in 2016, I remember one of our candidates said to me, he's like, oh, Ceci, do you know how much money you cost me last time? And he had a spreadsheet of like vote buying. And he's like, you know, all these voters started complaining that why weren't they seeing any of these public goods? And so then we had to go and buy more votes. And so I was like, you know, I don't know. What <laughs> I was like, please don't kill me after this, you know, like, <laughs> but, um, but uh, he thought it, he was just like, haha, you know, cost me a lot of money. Don't do that again. Um, but, um, but yeah, so they definitely were responding and aware of what we were doing. Um, the voters, I, I thought that was great because they would actually say things like, hey, we never had anything like this before. We've never seen anything like this before from our candidates. Um, and maybe my favorite reaction was from one of the voters had looked at his flyer and one of the things that the flyer is also what the municipal development fund is. And so this guy calculates in his head, like how much the vote buying is price per household in his, in his, in, in, in about how many people he thought were in his municipality. And then he said, wait a minute, I'd rather have the municipal development funds than the vote buying, right? He said, he said, you know, like we're not coming out ahead with vote buying. Um, it's actually a better deal for us to get the public goods. And I remember thinking like this guy just did all this math in his head to like compare the two numbers. Um, and, um, but then I found out why he was so good at math. He's the, also the guy who does the, um, what is it in English? The uh, illegal gambling that the, the, this happens in it. So it was, it was his- The his wet thing? Was, yeah, exactly. So, so he was doing the wet thing and I'm like, what's English for wet thing? But essentially it's like this, um, how, how to describe it, Liloya, oh, like yeah. lottery kind of, unofficial lottery. That's yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that was this guy's job. So he was like doing the numbers in his head and calculating and, and he was like, he looked at our flyers and he's like, hey, I'd rather have this stuff than the vote buying. Um, and so we, uh, we can see how there was demand for that kind of information. And that was an important factor for them um, that we thought was really interesting. Now, in terms of whether I think mayors would have tried to do it had they had the funds, um, I think there were some mayors who had tried in some ways, right? Like they were like the one that I was telling you who said he would build roads and you know like fix roads and build schools if he could. Um, and there's also been some where they've tried to do that kind of pre instead of vote buying, like one mayor was building water pumps in villages before the elections. But then in some places, the people got a little greedy and they're like, well, we already have this water pump. We're just gonna accept money from the other candidate. And after the mayor won, he looked at the results and when he saw villages that didn't vote for him, he sent around a construction crew to pull up the water pumps. It's like super, so it's very inefficient way of trying to think about how to make their promises credible and how to campaign on public goods provision. So I think in one way, what we did rather than it being a budget constraint is that we almost um, set up a brokerage for them in order for those who wanted to campaign on policies to essentially give them a way to do that. Um, so I think that was the bigger effect on that we had rather than them thinking about reallocating their campaign budgets. It was just, the ability to even have that be an option in the first place, I think was the key issue there. Great. Um, other questions? Okay. Oh, Sheila Coronel. Thank you, Sheila. Do you think the findings of your study apply at the national level? I was going to ask the same question. In a presiden <laughs> presidential election in 2016, does vote buying go through local politicians? How much of voting for national office gets influenced by local politicians. And if I, I, if I may piggyback on Sheila's question, does that mean that a campaign like Duterte is effective because he's able to talk like a mayor and he's able to ask the, pop, the, the, the national electorate to assess his policies based on a local record that 
that they can account for in a way that perhaps they couldn't account for kind of like the fiscal and macroeconomic changes brought about by, by someone like Amar Rojas, for instance? That's a great question. And I think a lot that is indeed a lot of the appeal, um, this sense that if you think about most Filipinos, our, our first point of contact is with our mayor, right? Like that is to us, who is the Philippine government? It's not necessarily the people in, uh, in, in Manila, it's the people that are in the municipal office, right? Um, or to a smaller extent, like you know, barangay captain and, and, and other barangay officials. Um, I think in terms of the, so the national level, it's complicated because of this tendency that I think vote buying does, you know, like a lot of um, candidates will buy a slate. So you'll, you'll see them, you, uh, especially around the, you know, we actually saw this all the way up to governor usually when in the off cycle elections, um, where uh, the national level or the provincial level politicians would contribute money to the cause. And then in exchange, the, the mayor is the one who coordinates the vote buying. So the mayor has the personnel to do the vote buying. And then if I'm a senator or a congressman, I just contribute funds and then they buy a whole slate of votes. Um, so I think that's what complicates the national level because a lot of it has to do with those kind of uh, not just how um, you know the local voters would view their mayor, but also the types of political alliances that the mayors will be making, uh, sort of up the concurrent election cycle. Um, but the flip side of that is, I think policies have a better chance of resonating at the national level because that, uh, to the extent that we see policies at all in Philippine uh, politics, I think uh, it's only at the national level, really, where we hear big debates about what should be done and big policies about, or big suggestions uh, of policies that people can actually have disagreements on. Um, so I think on one hand, it could be very powerful as a, as a campaign, as an information initiative. Um, at the, but the flip side is it would indeed be limited because so much of vote buying happens through these like, um, you know, these sort of vertical uh, alliances that politicians have. Um, so I think that there's a lot of difficulty in, in sort of squaring that circle. But the other side of it is that mayors aren't, you know, they're pretty strategic about this too, right? So if you're a very unpopular presidential candidate, they're probably not going to want to make a deal with you. They're going to want to make a deal with, um, uh, uh, with other uh, politicians that they think they can actually win with, right? And to the extent that we're campaigning on things like policies, I think that gives the, the, the national level politicians with actual programs to propose a real advantage. And so that's where you can also see that a lot of the campaign styles will reflect this, where you see a lot of like a sort of emotional or negative campaigning because those, what we find um, at least in other research is that that kind of thing operates only on sort of valence characteristics or like how people perceive how they like a candidate or not like a candidate. It doesn't really affect how they feel about the policies. And so if you're a candidate would not, you know, if you don't have good policies, then one really easy way to keep the debate, the national debate away from that is to do all of this sort of emotional and negative campaigning because that only operates on the dimensions that you care about, right? So you just want people to like you for, you know, whatever your last name or your personality or your previous experience and focusing the campaign away from policies is a really effective way to do that. Um, so I don't know, I feel like I'm not sure whether this makes me optimistic or not for the upcoming elections, uh, Sheila, sorry. But, um, but I do think that initiatives like this could potentially be more powerful at the presidential level because it is an arena where um, we're more used to talking about policies. Thank you. Um, oh, just to follow up on that, but, but, that, but does that mean then that it is better to nationalize policy discussion that can be grasped through a local lens? And what I mean by that is something like, you know, for example, Mayor Rodrigo Duterte saying that I fixed the, I, I had an anti-drug policy in Davao. So it, it was a it was it was policy, but it was very local and could be grasped as if you you are just assessing the policy of your mayor, uh, as as opposed to you know somebody like Mara who's saying like I brought in call center jobs because this was kind of my, like my macroeconomic philosophy. It it they're both policy, but one is graspable on a local on a local level. Yeah, 
Yes, absolutely. I, I think so. And I think actually a big part of the messaging that's really difficult, the economic messaging that we have is that we, you know, we're seeing numbers, um, you know, the number, the macroeconomic numbers all look good, but if inequality is high and we're not seeing those, you know, those macroeconomic lovely numbers at the local level, um, I think that can make the messaging really difficult as well. So yes, I think to some extent there is an advantage in simple messages that people can um, connect with in a, in a way um, rather than talking about economic growth when they're not seeing it and what's happening in their, in their localities. Um, I think what this tells us is that voters are really aware of what's happening. Like you can't fool them. They know if people keep their promises or not because they can see in their barangay, you know, is there a new school? Is there a new road? Um, and so I think the lesson for national politicians is like you can talk about macroeconomic growth all you want, but what is it that people are seeing in front of them and what is it happening at the, at the local level? And I think that was one big problem with the messaging. Um, for example, with the Liberal Party, you know, when uh, Noi Noi, it, it, like you're presiding over a period of unprecedented economic growth, or big successes in terms of macroeconomic statistics. But then, um, if people aren't seeing that in their barangay, then it's sort of hard to make that connection. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, national level politics is not my expertise, but I can definitely see how um, that type of messaging might resonate. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sorry to have to drag you into the, the <laughs> world no of Duterte studies. No worries. Um, no worries. Um, a question from David Levich. Can you talk a little bit about incumbency effect? How close are these local elections? How many candidates are running? Oh, that's a great question. Um, they are so incumbency effect is a very real thing in the Philippines, and in fact, it's so strong that you even get incumbency effect happening for relatives. So mayors have a term limit, um, and, but we, would, we could consider, the like, incumbency effects are so real thing that we could consider you know, the son or the wife or their deputy mayor, whoever their anointed successor is, um, as a, you sort of a re-election success for them. Um, but yeah, so they would get elected. Um, so they already have a tremendous advantage they would tend also, um, actually even this, is, and, and I, actually that's why our, um, I remembered our, our second treatment arm results were really striking because we saw people sort of um, punishing their incumbent when they weren't keeping promises. Um, and this was an effect that we saw that was more dramatic in, in the places where um, mayors were not providing public goods, for example, you could see like this dramatic like provision of information, like finding out about what, you know, where those gaps were, um, voters were responding to. Um, but in ordinary times, yes, mayors would typically get reelected, even their, you know, anointed successors, for example, would get reelected as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Um, other questions from our from our guests. Uh, we have until 5.30, but if folks have run out of questions, we don't have to finish the time. So I'm going to... We can ask We can ask Leloy about the upcoming elections instead. Oh my God, no, no. <laughs> I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared. Uh, it's, been, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy past week, but... Uh, I guess I think that's for another talk. We should we should invite we should we should invite you back on to talk about these kind of like more horse racy developments. I think. Um, Actually, I was just going to ask: Are you continuing this research through this next election cycle with the same sites? Not the same sites, that's but we're taking it actually national. Um, so here's where I'm going to be out of depth a little because um, we're. The, there's interest from Comelec to do this type of information provision, but in a more systematic way. So essentially getting candidates, all the candidates at the national level to provide the, you know, their platforms. And we haven't quite ironed out like what form that's going to take. Um, I'm voting for something like this where they have, they're forced to make trade-offs just because I'm afraid that candidates will say, oh, all those issues are important to me, or I do all of those things. Um, so I wanted to force them to have to make trade-offs in that way. Um, and the idea is to find ways to present this, um, this information to voters so that voters can 
look, you know, look at, you know, think about what they want in a candidate or what policies are important to them, and then look at the slate of candidates that are that are available as a result. Uh, so we're hoping to get that off the ground with Comelec, Um, and I'm actually hoping to see if there's interest in other NGOs or, or media organizations in this type of information provision at the national level. Um, just because, like I said, even in a context where we were thinking we had stacked the deck against us, you know, to do this in, you know, doing this in Marcos territory, right, in, uh, um, and in Sing Song territory, that it would be a but to see that voters were finding the information valuable and they were responding and reacting to it, um, I thought uh, would be a promising thing. But yes, we are going to try for the next elections uh, to do this in as, as large a scale as we can manage, I guess. I guess my other question is, um, I don't, you don't have to answer, but um, is this information transferable to U.S. Um, circumstances? I know election theories that go all over the place <laughs> with different countries. But um, in terms of what you found out, does it seem transferable, the information you? I have to say started? that I, when we started out, we didn't think that our work had much relevance for the US. Um, and then like, I feel like with Trump and you know this sort of new wave of American politics. Um, so on one hand, I'm happy for my work to have broader resonance, but on the other hand, you know, I'm like, I'd rather the U.S. remain a functioning democracy. So I'm like, eh, no flip side. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I think there is a lot of interest in the U.S. as well about how can we make voters more informed. Um, but in the U.S., I think the issues are more about misinformation and polarization rather than, you know, building up a tradition of policy based politics. Because the nice thing is they already have parties that function well. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually, this goes back to Sheila's question earlier about how to take this to the national level. If we had parties, we could do that, right? Because then everybody, here's your, you know, here's our platform. These are the things that we're going to spend on. And then everybody down the line has to do it, um, or at least, you know, some version of it that would be consistent. Um, and so for the U.S. already has that, which is great. So mostly what for them, what's interesting and um, where they find um, this type of work helpful is in thinking about misinformation and, you know, the ways that voters are evaluating candidates, but not necessarily on sort of what we would think as rational ways or about policy, right? Um, in the in the U.S., for example, the big thing is like why people vote against their economic interest, right? Like why would you, if you are somebody that is not going to benefit economically from voting for uh, the Republicans, why are you doing it? Um, and so there, our work on how voters evaluate the sort of policy things versus the more valence type of things, like um, that, I think, travels really well. Um, just that they're fortunate to have the party. So I think they have this nice infrastructure with which to work in and to sort of do that type of repairing. Whereas in the Philippines, we're basically starting from the ground up with policies, right? Like, how can we make them, how can we make it even possible for people to run on policies and have policies taken seriously? Okay, thanks. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> okay, this is a great question from Catherine Kerr. Uh, has vote buying become more expensive? I noticed that. Um, what was her name again? Ceci, the 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 woman selling her votes. Tadai, I know. <laughs> Tadai, her her prices are astronomical. Um, and she and she's not. Is she is she in an urban area? She's buying for a whole family. So her big. Oh, that's has right. Has a giant family that she says she can deliver. Oh, okay, okay. That's why she charges high. Okay, I understand yes. now. Yes. I think on a per person, like 500 would be like a kind of norm, right? At least that's my experience when it comes to like mayoral candidates. Um, it this actually, is yeah. Loban. I, it was similar in Zamboanga, a bit cheaper, yes. I think, but like 500. I saw 500 in the last election. Don't, don't know what it's going to be like this next election. Um, and then the second question she asks is, is social media a factor at the mayoral level? And then finally, any prognosis for elections during COVID? Oh, great question on the COVID. That's actually something I need to think about more too. Um, for the price per vote, we actually saw a lot of variation. So within municipalities, it would be all the same price, but across municipalities, it could be really different. So for example, um, voters hated when there was only one candidate because then vote buying is super low. It's just, you know, bus fare and a sandwich mm -hmm. um, just to get you to go out and vote, <laughs> no competition. Um, by contrast, there were some areas where there was a lot of illegal mining happening in Ilocosur where 
um, the price per vote was just, it was like incredible. You could buy votes in Los Angeles and San Francisco for it's like $120, $100 per, um, in, in US dollars. Um, and though the reason why it was so high was because the value of the office, essentially mayors could get elect, the illegal mining companies were putting money into the Bayoral race so that they could then, you know, be able to continue their operations and the kickbacks to the mayor. Um, and so there were some areas in our study where the vote buying prices were really out of bounds. And that has to do with the potential returns to the office later on in terms of corruption and kickbacks. Um, so what I find is that usually is the driving point of the, of the price per vote. Um, and then if I can tell you this one story, Catherine, it, it, you didn't ask about this, but this is how we know the prices for votes. So we had a survey, we were also asking people, but of course, because sometimes people might forget or not feel comfortable giving us the amounts, the way we validated it is we got permission from the archbishop in, um, in, 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 in the region to um, interview parish priests to find out what the price per vote in all the different villages were. And the reason that they know is because, um, uh, you know, they could find out through confession because people have, if, if they ask people what, what, how much money they receive, then people would have to tell them. Now, the flip side of all of this is that all of this is supposed to be secret and it's a sacrament, in fact, that um, even a, a not so great Catholic like me would know that rule. But we were able to make a deal where um, we could find out just about the prices in an area, not necessarily what each person was paid individually. And so we use this um, to validate the vote prices and to get a sense of what vote prices were across the, the province in a way that I think would have been really difficult for us to find out like all those different numbers on our own. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one thing that, that we had to do for those, for those numbers. Um, in terms of whether it's gotten more expensive, I think yes, especially to the extent that the value of the office has increased, right? So the, the more opportunities there are to make money as a mayor, the more expensive the vote buying gets in those places. Um, social media does play a role increasingly so. I think even between looking between um, you know, 2013 and 2016, I, we already felt like there was a big difference in the role of social media. Um, it tends to be almost entirely Facebook because that's what's uh, free for accessing data. Um, so essentially they have just one source of information on social media and it's Facebook. Um, but we tend to see that social media tends to be a bigger deal for the national races, right? Like where, um, you know, that's where they get their information. Whereas in local races, you know, if you ask people, where do you get your information? Well, you get it from, you know, Manang at the marketplace, or you get it from, you know, your relatives. Um, and so there tends to be a different source of information that they get um, uh, for the local races than they do for the national ones. Um, so yeah, so I think that's like the, um, the bigger context, but that's something that's always changing. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if social media is increasingly an important source for them, even at the local level. Um, these days, just because of how much it's increasing in prominence overall. Yeah, I mean, in the Philippines, Facebook is the internet. Um, it is entirely the internet. And the, I think, sir, like, it, it's negligible, the difference between the people, the percentage of Filipinos who use the internet and the percentage of Filipinos who use Facebook. The, the number is almost identical. Um, Ray Castillo has a question. Any polarity in votes or preferences by overseas voters? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we actually didn't get any in our sample because um, they 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 could of course they could vote um, uh, uh, from from abroad, but uh, they unless they were there for their survey, we wouldn't have been able to interview them. What we did find though is that um, you know things like um, remittances would matter. So things like um, and the idea that in addition to transmitting money from abroad, a lot of times we're transmitting social values and political views as well. So we could, there are definitely some interesting patterns in how, um, uh, you know, we don't, I don't know about how they voted necessarily, but I do know that just the fact that you have relatives in democracies like Canada and the US affect how you vote and think about elections. Um, then if your relatives were in places like, um, you know, the Middle East or Saudi Arabia, where the electoral, you know, there's no elections in the, in the same type of way. Um, oh, and yes, I, I noticed, sorry, I had the question about COVID. Absolutely, I, uh, um, I, I should have taken that first, especially since it's still so relevant. 
Um, we basically have paused all, you know, sort of in-person research activities for now. Um, and so I think with the elections coming up, uh, it's sort of going to evolve in the same type of way where uh, thinking about how to do an election at, during COVID times is going to be really tricky. Even things like, you know, one of the initiatives we're helping Comelec with is voter registration. Um, and so normally these are things like if you don't know how to do it, you can just go down, you know, you can go in person and ask somebody for help. Um, but what we've, um, we've sort of redoubled efforts to help with voter registration, um, making like very social media friendly instructions for how to get yourself registered to vote. Um, because people can't go in person, you know, and ask their friend for help or ask, you know, go down to their, you know, municipal hall and ask for help. Um, but we do find that one concern that I had with the switch to, you know, how we're trying to help people get registered to vote, for example, is that I worry that we're, we're, we're helping a lot the people who already have access to things like internet and social media and, and everything else like that by these, you know, because everything is online um, or putting these instructions online. But when we were doing our town halls, what we found is that there was a big gap in, in the help and the access to resources that you, if you didn't have, you know, smartphones and you didn't have um, broadband in your barangay, that um, even just simple things like registering to vote have all of a sudden been really hard. Um, what we're hoping is that at the same time, uh, sort of, well, I guess not at the same time, it's happening already, is the Philippines is also rolling out a national ID program. So um, that has been sort of a mix of in-person, social distance, trying to get everybody registered. But we were actually trying to get the PSA to, in a, you know, at the, at the same time they have those kiosks where you can get your national ID. We wanted somebody from Comelec sitting right next to them so they can go ahead and register to vote at the same time. Um, so with the, you know, COVID interdepartmental coordination, I don't think they were quite able to make it happen. Um, in that way, but that was for us one sort of natural way to think about how to get around the problem of COVID is uh, through these means where we're just getting better data in, in to begin with, getting better paperwork and sort of helping the government be able to find all the citizens that need to be voting through this process of the national ID. And we're hoping some of that will carry over um, to voter registration as well. Um, but yes, I, I agree it's a challenge and I, I'm afraid that the people that are going to suffer the most are the ones who are already, um, you know, marginalized in other ways. Okay, other questions? All right, um, questions going, going. Okay, gone. Well, this is very <laughs> auspicious. I think uh, very auspicious for the research that Professor Ceci Cruz is going to be doing, but also very auspicious for the future of the study of the Philippines here in California and the UC system in particular. So thank you very much. That was a terrific talk. And thank you for all your questions and for engaging our speaker today. Maraming salamat po. Thank you.